Ooh, that hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> I'll be with you guys in just a second. Let's see if I can get my, uh, my monitor all set up here. In the meantime, commence. horrible scratching. <laughs> Too bad I don't have a, a quick microphone turned down. Now, I hope, I sincerely hope that uh, Kate and Tom, I mean Kate, I'm sorry, I just finished painting with Tom and it. Hope, I hope that Kate and Jack um, we'll be watching this. They're not watching right now, but I will let them know. And this looks, honestly, it looks pretty awful, right? What I'm doing right now <laughs> looks awful. It feels awful. All right. Hello, friends. <laughs> I, I am a destroyer of artwork. My name is Dan Nelson. Maybe you know that. And uh, I am doing, here we go. Dan's Art Adventure number 21, Fixing Kate and Jack. Ready, set, go. <laughs> DAA. That stands for Dan's Art Adventure for you newbies. All right. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to take this, this off, but I will lift it up at the bottom. I want you to be able to see uh, Kate and Jack's painting. My deep apologies to to Kate and Jack that I'm that I'm getting to their painting so late. I, I was at their wedding in Jupiter, Florida, two weeks ago today, and this is the first chance I've had to to get back. Let's see if I turn off this light. Can you get a better view? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Not great, All right? Uh, Kate and Jack, beautiful couple in a beautiful place. This is a, an old uh, equestrian show barn uh, converted into a wedding venue. And I'm happy to say that the, most of the painting is finished. I'll do, I'll do touch up to all of it and I'll broadcast that almost certainly. But this is as far as I got with Kate and Jack and as you can see, <laughs> I don't usually show this part because it's just so, it's just so frightening. But let me explain a little bit. So this is, as, before I scraped it off, that was, as, that was as far as I got during the reception. And back in the olden days, I used to finish all my wedding paintings at the reception. But that was before, that was long before the days of photorealistic portraits. And, I would finish the bride and groom in an impressionistic style, and that was close enough. As you may know, my style has evolved now, I now, and I'm very happy with the way it's gone. Um, so where I'm doing very tight portraits, even though doing a portrait this size is very challenging, but that's what I do. Uh, so what I'm doing right now is there's just a little bit too much texture. I, was, I am afraid, was afraid that if I just started doing a finished portrait on top of all this, this is of course layers. I'm saying of course, if you're familiar, familiar with my technique, this is layers of acrylic paint and then layers of oil on top of the acrylic. Okay, that's, that's the way I paint. I paint oil on top of the acrylic and I'm just right now I'm just feeling for any thick bits by the way let me explain what I'm doing this with it is it's an exacto knife but the curved blade <laughs> if you didn't know that what you see me doing here would just be would be disastrous would just be woo, because the point if it was a regular exacto knife the point would be gouging into the canvas so the fact that it's a, a curved blade this way is very important. All right. 
I don't always do this. I don't always obliterate the uh, the work that I've done, the previous work that I've done. But as you can see, I do sometimes. And now I'm going to do one more step of obliteration. <laughs> and that is, I'm doing a scumbling on a very, very thin layer of well, yellow ochre and white at the moment. Let's add a little bit of oxide red to that. Very light and very, very, very thin. So I, I do want to keep uh, some, I don't want, like, I would not want a bare white, you can tell I've been working here, can't you? I would not want, want a, a perfectly clean canvas here. I, I'm one of those crazy artists. I kind of like dirt. <laughs> that's one way to put it. And so that's, that's what I'm getting right here. So I, I don't want to lose all, all the texture and busyness. It's underneath. So here's, again, white for her white dress. And uh, should I do a little bit of gray? I think I will for his tux. Yeah, dark, dark gray, bluish gray. All right, now let me do a little bit more explaining before I start going. Hello, Tiago. <laughs> Hello, John Malanzi Art. Good to have you guys with me. Um, so after I got home, again, I did all of this before the scratching, all of this at the reception, and I'm quite happy with most of this out here. I'll, I'll tweak it, but it'll stay more or less the way it is. Um, after I got home, I went upstairs to my computer and my Photoshop, and I took the photograph from which I was painting. Of course, at the, at the wedding, I just had this photo on my, on my phone, you know? And I carefully, tweak this photo to match the painting. That's, that's kind of important. Let's start there for just a minute. Conventional, traditional, intuitive thinking would say you, you print a photo if you're painting from a photo. You have a photo and you copy the painting to match the photo, right? That's ordinary, that's right. What I just said is the opposite of that though. I make the photo to match the painting. What I mean is I, I measured this carefully and then and did a number of things to this. Not just, not just I stretched their, their figures. Here's, here's my other, my full length reference here. And um, so I made this the size of the painting. The reason for that is when I, for me anyway, when I paint, not copying a photo, just, well, I mean, not, anyway, I, I trust my intuition. I, I, I'll stand back from the canvas. When, when I first start putting the bride and groom, in particular, when I first start putting the bride and groom in, I'll step back from the canvas, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet, several times and see, are they the right size? Is, are they in the right position? Are they, uh, because the, the background, this photo, and this photo are completely separate, right? They, they did do their first dance on this dance floor, but I didn't, this is not from one photo. All right, does that make sense? I don't have a photo of them here. I have a photo of them somewhere else and the photo of the background. So I have to make sure that they fit together. Anyway, uh, and I trust my intuition. I trust, I trust my intuition to get their physique, their, their figures, elongated just the right just the right amount in my opinion all good portrait painters elongate their figures somewhat that's just standard operating procedure um we're 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 portraying an idealized figure not not photographically realistic right i want them to look at it and say oh we look wonderful and by the way <laughs> this couple they were they were a very handsome couple 
and they were very long and skinny anyway, so they required m minimal stretching, trust me. Anyway, so I, I work on the photograph, I work on the color. It's all designed to, to match the painting. Right, then the next thing I do, and I think you can see this here, I put a line, just a single XY line on the photograph. I'll talk about why it's laminated here in a minute. And then I do the exact same XY axis here. In fact, I just wiped out a little bit too much of that line with all my scratching and painting. So I'm going to reinforce this one. Now somebody might say, well, you're, you're putting a line on your, you're putting lines on your painting? Is, doesn't that show up in the finished painting? And the answer is, uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> It, it, it shows up so slightly that nobody but me, and maybe now you and me, would ever see it. Because I, 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 I'm pretty careful when I'm all done to make sure that it gets covered up. But even if it's not entirely covered up, it's okay. It's not disfiguring like here where it goes across her neck, of course. I'll make sure that disappears. Same thing here on her arm and so forth. But anyway, yes, this will get, the lines get covered up. All right, then what that allows me to do then and here's, I'm just going to get started on this process because it's dreadfully boring. <laughs> I'm going to um, start measuring. Okay, the first one thing I'm doing right now is making uh, marks. Like the back of his, their heads are curved. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> but <laughs> our heads are more or less circle-ish. <laughs> All right. Wait, let's start with a real easy one, though. And then, then this broadcast is not going to go terribly long because this process of measuring uh, could take me a couple hours and it would be just dreadfully boring. But let's start out with where her neck intersects the x-axis. Okay, and I've got a compass or a divider here using them as, as a caliper. So all those words are appropriate. All right, so um, that's, that's where her neck goes. Now her nose, the tip of her nose is pretty well defined, but it's two measurements, not right? Not one. Both the X and the Y measure, the, the up and down in the horizontal, both of those. So the tip of her nose is right there. So now I know now that that's very precise. Let's do uh, her eyeball, the iris or pupil of her eye, okay? So every one of these entails two measurements. So in that regard, this process is a little bit uh, uh, ponderous. All right, so there's Okay, so I have three dots now that I know are exactly right. Neck, nose, eye. Let's do, again, very easily defined. Oh, and by the way, I do have one other tool here, and it is a, a traditional compass. The only advantage of this is that it's even more precise than the regular dividers or calipers because you have to turn this screw. To a, and and the, the downside of this is you could accidentally bump it ever so slightly between here and here. Does that make sense? So if I'm really worried or fussy about getting that right, then I'll actually use, so I use both of these tools a fair amount. But someone might say, well, you don't need those fancy things, do you? No, 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 you, absolutely, no, you do not. You could do the same thing. Where's that ruler I just had here a minute ago? Here it is. Someone might tell you, well, couldn't you do the same thing with a ruler? And indeed you could. Let's, let's do one. Let's do this dot up here. Okay, so it's what I call a half under two inches. And what I mean a half is a half of a sixteenth. So what is that? 31, but I don't say, here's one of the downsides of a ruler. It's 1 and 31 30 seconds of an inch. One, how many syllables is that? 17 syllables, I don't know, whatever. That's, that's a mouthful. 
and just making your brain say all those. Okay, now this one is two and a quarter minus a quarter. What, what does that mean? That means two and a quarter inches minus a quarter of a sixteenth. Whew, so what is that? That's, um, you know, um, a sixty-four, a hundred twenty-eight. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you do that. All right. So, yes, you can do it with a ruler. I hope I've demonstrated why I don't like the ruler. The other thing is, once I get later in the stages, and this had ex when this will actually have wet oil paint on it, the ruler is touching the canvas is going to pick up wet paint. See, so that's. Yes, you can use the ruler. Go for it. It's just not as fast and a little bit more messy than using dividers. And I'll let you watch just a few more minutes. So let's say any place there's a curve, there's not a real easy place to mark. So I'll use a Sharpie marker. Now I'm doing, I'm doing the curve of her hair, her hairline in her temple. But the question would be, well, it's a curve. Where? So I mark it, and I leave that little dot right there, and that's what I'm going to measure. Now, I've talked about this kind of thing so often that, you know, I'm not going to repeat it all, but for anybody that's new, um, someone, someone might say, oh, isn't that cheating? <laughs> Um, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. In fact, I, I used the word cheating for many years. And finally, one of my dear followers persuaded me not to use that word anymore. So now I try to call it most of the time photomechanical tricks or photomechanical tips and tricks. So there's where her there's that dot right there's where her nose meets her top top lip meets the filstrum is that what that's called let's do some more i think her chin is pretty the the apex of her chin is pretty well defined so i don't need to put a dot i don't think but again most of these measurements are, require two measurements Now, let me pick you up just for a second so you can see what this looks like right now. So you get, do you see those dots? Whoops, hang on, hang on, hang on. There we go. Do you see those dots? <laughs> uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got six so far. Now, I just have to know what they correspond to on the photograph. By the way, if you want to see somebody else do this, um, who, who does, who is a very good, very good portrait painter, is Michael Carder with a D. Carder, with a D, and uh, he's a he's a big dog, as I like to call him. He's a big dog portrait painter. He did the Bush presidents. Okay, I, I don't mean he did it for fun. He, he was the official. <laughs> He was the official, he did the official portraits of the bush. So he's, he's a big dog. And he uses this, a similar technique. Not exactly, but very similar. And when he's f finished uh, this stage, this phase of his painting, the portrait, um, it, it looks a lot like this. It, it, well, without the, uh, on this one, I happen to have an erroneous, portrait ghosted in the background, right? So he doesn't have that. But just imagine this being a flat canvas with a hundred dots on it, maybe 50 dots on it. And then it's just a matter of trick connecting the dots. Now, just one more thing about this quote unquote cheating thing. Um, someone might say, isn't that cheating? Because you think, you think artists are supposed to do it, all, do it all the hard way. Well, yes, but no. The, the truth is, and anybody, let me interrupt myself here for a minute. 
it turns out I don't need to do two measurements for every single point. The reason is when I get close to the X and Y axes, when I get close to these lines, I can pretty much estimate like that right there. I'm going to call it. It's a generous quarter of an inch south of that of the horizontal line. Does that make sense? So I don't have to measure that because that's I my my eye can measure that pretty darn accurate. I'm within a you know 128 of an inch of accurate. So when you get close to these lines, I don't feel like I need to measure at all. Let's do the back of her neck. And then, as I said, this this is it is just will become dreadfully boring for you to watch. I just want you to get the idea. Okay, I interrupted myself. Even after doing all the photo mechanical tricks in the world, and I use I use them all. I also, by the way. Just again, I want you to have a realistic appraisal of who I am and where I fit in. You can go to my website and see my portraits. You know, they stand or fall on their own merits. Uh, I'm not a big dog portrait painter, but I'm a I'm a, I'm a big dog wedding painter. <laughs> if there's such a thing, and there's not. <laughs> um, even after all the photo mechanical tricks have been employed, you still have to draw. You still have to be able to see. You still have to be able to copy. You still it still comes down to look and copy, look at, for for a portrait, for an accurate portrait. Okay, so um, these tricks can only get you so far. Um, for instance, uh, my old friend Drew Blair, D R U. Drew Blair is arguably the best and most realistic airbrush artist in the world. He used to live here in Raleigh, my hometown, and I had the the immense privilege of working with him a little bit. Learned tons just by watching him work. And he uses he traces extensively, okay? As do most photorealistic artists. But it's not the tracing that gets him across the finish line. It's not the tracing that makes him the best and most realistic artist in the world. It's everything he does after the tracing is over. The tracing just gets you so close, not very close. Okay, so that's just an example. By the way, if you want to see an example of his work, um, since I mentioned him, Drew, D-R-U, Drew Blair, um, Google these words. Go to Google and Google, this is not a photograph. And there's two paintings by him. One is a model woman named Tico, Tika, Tico, Tika, Tika, I think. And then another black man face. Uh, anyway, those are two paintings by Drew Blair that he sort of did just to silence his critics. And it's pretty funny because there's a whole bunch of comments on those saying, this is, this, uh, this is a photograph. This is not a painting. You could tell it's a photograph because blank, blank, blank. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's a, it is a photograph. All right. So I think I've shown you enough. I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you leave me alone. <laughs> and I'm going to spend. I'm going to put on a, a nice uh, podcast. <laughs> History, philosophy, science, theology. <laughs> theology came out wrong. Who knows art? Who knows what? I'm, anyway, I'm going to listen to something because I'm going to be standing here doing this crazy OCD type measuring for a good while. All right, so the next time I'm doing something exciting on Jack and Kate, I'll let you know. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs> hey, Jim, I saw your comment. Yeah, weird. you don't know these people, huh? All right.